Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm going to let this run for a second, see if we get anybody on here, see if it's going. I just noticed I don't have my microphone. Hopefully it's sounding okay. If anybody gets in there and uh, can hear this, let me know. Let me grab my drink. So, we got here, we are in New Hampshire, and uh, this is my office here, and I've got a room that I'm going to be using for like a studio kind of thing over there. Um, oh, thanks, Stray Kitten, appreciate that. Um, so, yeah. I didn't have too much to talk to tonight. I was really going to talk a little bit about um, relocating, what this process was like, and uh, oh, thank you, Prepper Cowboy, um, how much I recommend that if you're in a, a really deep blue state or even a purple area um, or something like that, that you consider relocating. Um, it's a monumental pain in the ass. This is uh, what's left of a ghost tequila margarita. If you've never had ghost tequila and you like just a little bit of spice, you should really try it. It's really, really good. So anyway, um, uh, as far as I know, you know, if you wanted to relocate in the Northeast, if you live in the Northeast, New Hampshire is probably the best place to be in the Northeast. Um, maybe there's some argument for Maine too, but Maine is a, a little bit more uh, purplish as far as the politics go. New Hampshire is definitely more uh, firearm friendly, um, but it's not bad as far as that goes. The, um, the, um, hey, what's going on, Herbert Oakley? And Susan. Um, Maine is good for the from the political standpoint. Uh, or excuse me, New Hampshire is good from the political standpoint. Maine is probably a little bit better from a prepper standpoint. They, I, I haven't spent a ton of time in Maine, but it seems like they have better um, topsoil and all that kind of stuff because New Hampshire is not really great for prepping. Um, it's both states have really short growing seasons, but New Hampshire specifically, uh, it's very difficult, at least in Southern and mid New Hampshire, where, uh, where we purchased, um, is really, really difficult to find, um, a lot that has good soil and is not extremely rocky. I mean, they call, they call New Hampshire the granite state for a reason, because, there is a ton, a ton of, of granite and it's, it's surface level granite. Like it's, it's right there. Um, and we probably looked at 50 different houses trying to find uh, one that has a good lot, uh, like the one that we got. And we jumped on it really quick when we found it because they're just, they're not very many of them up here. Um, yeah, the cold weather and all that kind of stuff is definitely going to be a problem long term. Um, you know, you don't, you don't get a, a crazy long growing season. Now you can extend that out with having, uh, greenhouses and all that kind of stuff. The, another good thing about New Hampshire though, is that, um, it is a rural, it's a very rural state. Like you can be 15 minutes outside of a, a big city and you're in the middle of nowhere. You know, I mean, you're, there's, there's literally, you know, you're in the Hills, you get 20, 25, 30 minutes outside the city like we are now, and you're, <laughs> there's nothing around. I mean, you know, you're, you're literally out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a good thing. I think one of the problems with New Hampshire in particular, and sorry to focus on this area. It's just, this is what I'm most recently, you know, learning about. Um, they don't have any state income tax on earned income, but they do have uh, ridiculous property taxes. 
And when I say ridiculous, I mean I'm paying almost a thousand dollars a month in just property taxes. Um, now they they also don't have sales tax on goods, so you know this is this the, the property tax is their only source of income, um, or you know the majority of it, I guess. But um, I don't know. Uh, I'm 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 not convinced that we're going to retire here or anything like that. I'm probably thinking about uh, I got three years left till I can retire from uh, from my current position and we'll probably be moving to either Tennessee or Idaho if I had to guess. Um, I don't really know for sure, but that's that's probably where we're headed. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, moving is a pain in the ass. I, I will tell you that. Um, I use the pods for the move and they are a little bit expensive. All in all, I used um, I used four of their largest pods. They're eight foot by eight foot by 16 foot. And I filled four of them completely full. And then I also had my seven by 14 trailer completely full on two different trips and my 16 foot flatbed full on two different trips. <laughs> so we had a, a, a lot, a lot of stuff. And it was a huge pain. Now, the pods thing made it pretty cool because we were able to have two delivered to the house. We filled those two up with kind of all the non-essential stuff. And then uh, once those were full, they came and got those, brought us two more. And then those last two were kind of like all the things that we really needed to use in the house and everything. And then they delivered those two first to the new house. So we unloaded those. And then got the um, got the uh, the second ones, the the non essential stuff, you know. Later, um, it was a little it was a little uh, unnerving, you know, not having <laughs> all access to all of uh, all my firearms and all those kinds of things. Not that that not that I ever really need them or anything, but um, and just, you know, that whole moving process and everything was, it was kind of strange because we had to come through New York City and, or through New York and through, you know, with New York, you can't, you can't bring assault weapons through New York. Now, a lot of you guys who are familiar with firearms law are going to say, yeah, but what about the Firearms Owner Protection Act? Well, the thing is, is that there's been some judgments that have said that, uh, if the state bans specific weapons, then they can keep those weapons from coming through the state. So that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a gray area on how to, how to deal with that. But, um, I, th I figured if, if FedEx can move them from gun dealer to gun dealer up into the Northeast, then pods can probably move them through the area too. And that's, that's what happened. And it seemed to work out pretty good. What's up killing 110? Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a rough couple of months. Um, the first, you know, like I said, month and a half was just staying in a hotel, um, and, and just looking at houses constantly. And then once we, we found this one, we got our offer in, we paid 10,000 over asking, we didn't give any inspections and, um, offered to do a quick close. And and we were able to uh, to get it. And it was lucky we did because the uh, following the, the later part of the afternoon, they already had six more offers after they accepted ours. Um, the market up here has been just brutal as far as that goes. I mean, competition has been bad. Now, it is slowing down now. Um, it is it is slowing down significantly up here in the area. Um, uh, prices are dropping, um, houses are staying on the market longer, the, the higher level houses, you know, over 500 are staying on the market a lot longer. The houses that are still between like 300 and 500,000 are selling pretty fast. Cause that's, that's a, that's a cheap, you know, source, or that's a, um, a cheap house in this area. Um, killing 110 says we have any water sources on the property kind of. Not entirely, but kind of. I'm thinking about expanding it. We have a 
Well, I take that back. We do have we do have one in the front. Um, it's basically a cattail pond. There is water in it um, pretty much all the time, but it's it's not like a like a functional pond. You know what I'm saying? It's just a like a drainage pond basically. But you could get water out of it. Then the other thing that I was thinking about is we have what they call a wetland area, and we're here in New Hampshire. Um, if you have any sort of a wetland, you can't mess with it. Like you can't mess with it at all. You're not supposed to, I guess. I don't really know if that includes making it deeper because I'm thinking about renting an excavator and, and digging it out so that it'll hold more water. I don't know if I'm really supposed to do that or not, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that all goes. Um, you're not supposed to build near it or anything like that to disturb it. So I guess my argument would be I'm not building next to it. I'm just making it a better habitat for more because that's the whole thing is it's supposed to be habitat for the uh, environment. So I, I would I would try to make the argument that I'm making it a better habitat, I think, because it would be, you know, what I mean, but um, anyway, yeah, that's what we've got as far as water. Then we have a well, obviously. I don't know how deep the well is. I need to look that up in the county records and find out how deep it is. Um, my sense of it is, is it's probably not extraordinarily deep. I don't think it would really need to be um, because there's uh, quite a bit of water in the area. So what's going on? The lamb is the light in Maryland Parmalee. Hello, hello. Uh, Susan Morris says she's buying in January when it's below 10 below and moving in the spring. Oh, that's, that's probably good. If you can find houses on the market that are for sale at that time of year, then do it. You know, um, like I said, I, I think that, uh, Florida wouldn't be a terrible place right now. Um, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, um, Missouri, Kansas, maybe even parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, Idaho, if you like colder weather, if you like to be up north more. That ghost tequila, man, that makes a perfect margarita. You should definitely check it out if you like margaritas. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so part of the criteria that we had when we moved, we wanted at least two acres. That was the very minimum. Um, and we got a little bit more than that, but not a whole lot more. Um, because the right two acres can, can be enough. You know what I'm saying? If you, if it's situated appropriately and you can use it and all that kind of stuff. And really the two acres that we have here is probably more functional and more usable from a prepping perspective than the eight acres we had in Indiana. Um, I'm, so I'm excited to be able to get stuff going and get some fence in and all that kind of stuff and hopefully get some different animals. We've got some chickens now, which we've, we've had three, uh, three killed two or three in the last couple of days, some sort of predator. I think it's a hawk, um, has got them. So we're, we're going to keep them locked up for a little while, maybe just let them out for like an hour or so at the end of the day or something. But, um, and I'm going to have to end up probably rebuilding the uh, chicken coop and, and at least or moving it um, and, and putting it in a different area because where it's located is where I'm going to end up building a shop. So that kind of sucks, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, what questions you guys got about the moving process? Uh, like I said, we used the pods. It was pretty good. Those four pods... Um, coming from Indiana to New Hampshire ended up costing me about twelve thousand dollars all in all, all told, and they did give me like a ten percent military discount. So um, it, you you do need to uh, a lot quite a bit of money for that, um, you know. But oh, I, I totally agree with you, Susan. She said Susan says some are concerned about balkanization and being stuck with the blue states um, south of New Hampshire and Maine. I 100% I agree with you. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why we probably won't be here long term is just because I don't like the the long term prospects of, um, of this area. Because eventually, 
what's going to end up happening. And the reason the market is so ridiculous right now is because all the people who can are moving out of New York City and moving out. And, you know, like anybody who has any degree of sanity is moving out of New York City and they're coming up here paying cash for houses, you know, way over asking. We had one one house that we bid on. We bid 15000 over asking. And the the winning bid was sixty five thousand over asking. I mean that's stupid. And I couldn't even, I couldn't believe that. I was like that's freaking nuts, man. Um, but yeah, the the whole balkanization thing is a real issue. I've got a video coming up where I'm going to talk about that. I had this video. It was a really strange thing. I um, we were in the hotel when when I kind of got the idea for this video. And, um, it was weird. I, I like, I had been thinking about how to like try to like trying to, to break down the, like the different phases of kind of what's, what's coming and, and like what we're going through and what's kind of coming or what it seems like to me anyway. And I woke up at like three thirty or four o'clock in the morning and it was just like, bing, 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 bing right right down the line. Like it's this and then this, and then this leads to this and this leads to this. And these are the overlaps. And it, it like, it just became super, super clear to me that this is what's happening. Um, so I figure I'll do a video on that here. One of these days, I'm, I'm hoping to get at least a really good start on the studio um, this weekend. So hopefully uh, I can start doing a little, you know, videos more frequently and all that kind of stuff and get kind of back into it. Lamb is the light says, I won't be moving. I've been here all my life too old now. Well, I hear you, my man. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just a shy, just a shy under 50 and I, I don't really want to move anymore. Um, but this isn't the place that I want to end up settling down. I don't think so. We'll probably move at least one, you know, one, one more time in three to four years. My youngest son, uh, is going to be a freshman in high school this year. And uh, we found a real good um, Christian school up here and got him in that. And um, so once he graduates, uh, then we'll we'll be figuring out what we're going to do next, you know. But I don't know. Utah Mike, what's going on? Let's see. Yeah, Montana's not a bad place either. We have considered Montana for sure. Um, it's a little further, like, my wife's family is from Spokane. And so if we could get close to Spokane, that would be kind of cool. We've never been able to be close to them throughout our whole, you know, tour with the, with the military. So if we could do that, that would be kind of neat. Uh, survival's farmer says, what do you think about Kentucky? I think Kentucky is a great spot. I got to spend quite a bit of time down there. Um, when I was in Indiana and it's beautiful, just beautiful beautiful country. I mean, driving through there and going to some of the different, um, uh, like the, the whiskey, whiskey distilleries and stuff like that is really, really kind of neat. We kind of pulled into, uh, Jim, Jim Beam, uh, once and just that drive down through there was really, really cool. Um, Yeah, Nikki Hicks says moving my preps is going to be the job. Tell me about it. I had a whole, uh, probably, well, one whole pod, pretty much one whole pod. I'd say at least three quarters of it was uh, all my prepping stuff, gear and food, and you know all that kind of stuff was one one whole pod. And then the other whole pod was pretty much all my shop and my you know shop stuff. Um, yeah, the reason I moved here, Stray Kitten, is because um, of work. I was uh, purged from a, a federal joint task force that I was on because of my YouTube channel here. <laughs> and uh, they, I guess they thought that I was too conservative. I, I don't know. It, it's it's weird because I'm, I'm really kind of middle of the road on a lot of stuff. But anyway, uh, a three-letter agency didn't want me working there anymore, and so they, they asked me to leave. And so I said, okay, I'll go somewhere else. So, uh, my agency took a look at the whole situation and said, Hey, JJ, you didn't do anything wrong. 
uh, everything that you've said is First Amendment protected and you, you're good to go. And so um, they allowed me to be reassigned up here. And it was either here or L.A. or San Diego. <laughs> and I was like, the lady asked me, she's like, well, how do you feel about moving to L.A.? And I was like, <laughs> I said, my wife would divorce me if you made me move to L.A. I said, there's no way. And she's like, well, what about San Diego? And I was like, that's just as bad. And then she's like, well, what about Massachusetts working out of Hanscom? And I was like, well, I said, I guess we could live in, we could live in New Hampshire. Because I, I couldn't even, I don't even know how long it would take me to register all my firearms and all that kind of stuff if I tried to live in New Hampshire or in, uh, in Massachusetts. It would be, God, they'd send out the freaking... <laughs> It'd be it'd be funny. The ATF probably be knocking on my door. But anyway, South Florida DCO, what's going on, man? Oh, we got Renaissance Marine in the house too. How you doing, Bubba? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Utah Mike says life is good here, but nowhere is perfect. That's a hundred percent true. I mean, we've been to a lot of places. I mean, just since I've had the YouTube channel, we've been from Omaha to Virginia, from Virginia to Cheyenne and Wyoming, and then from Wyoming to Indiana and Indiana to here, <laughs> just in the 10 years that, that I've been doing this, this whole YouTube thing. Crypto home girl, how you doing? Western Kentucky, that's a pretty area. Yeah. Um, it's a weird situation. Uh, Lamb is the light. He, he said, thanks for your hand, your stand. Sorry to hear about it. It, it, it wasn't, um, it was, it was really pretty unexpected. I think a lot of what it had to do with was inner office politics. And, um, sometimes I speak my mind pretty, uh, pretty plainly and I don't really hold back in. I think that it's, most likely the whole situation was I hurt some people's feelings, um, kind of hurt their egos a little bit and they didn't, they didn't like, <laughs> um, being shown up by a task force officer, you know, somebody who wasn't in their agency. And, um, and so they used, they used me as an opportunity to try to, to try to get a promotion, to try to show the headquarters people, you know, all those, all those people who are running all the, you know, all the ridiculous stuff you read about in the news, um, that, uh, that they're on their team. They're like, Hey, I'm on team blue. You know what I mean? I think that's what it was personally, just kind of reading in between the, the reading in between the lines on all this stuff, but yeah, you know, whatever. All right. <laughs> Did I get them a pacifier before they left? Yeah, that's that's pretty much what they needed, you know. Um, and I I just kind of I'm I'm not a, a true believer in karma, but I do believe that you kind of get what you you get what you give, you know what I mean? And um, so I didn't I didn't throw a fuss about it or anything like that. I I didn't really worry about it. I'm like, yeah, if you don't want me, that's fine. I'll go someplace else, you know. And uh, so Mike B says, how did you like Cheyenne? I didn't like Cheyenne at all. Don't be honest with you. I really liked the people. I really liked the people. I had I had a lot of great friends out there, a lot of great coworkers out there, uh, a lot of great business contacts and and people that I worked with, colleagues and everything like that. I really liked the political attitude of the state and the and the uh, firearms friendliness and you know all that kind of thing. But the geography of Cheyenne in particular is not what most people think. When most people think Cheyenne, Wyoming, they think about, well, really, they're thinking about Jackson Hole, which is in the northwestern part of the state. Cheyenne is in the southeastern part of the state. And the two are nothing alike. Now, if I could live in Jackson Hole, Aside from all the liberals that are up there, I would totally do that because it's a beautiful area. But that is not Cheyenne. Cheyenne is like a moonscape. Trees don't grow there. 
grass barely grows three to six weeks out of the year. Um, and the wind blows like you cannot believe. I mean, we had 70 mile an hour winds on a regular basis. I saw in one day, I saw 28 blowovers, semi trucks get blown over on their side um, out at work. I mean, it's it's a really, really hellish place to live. And as a matter of fact, when I was living there, I was like, I and I think we had two or we 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 had two hail claims on our roof just in four years. And and one, we ended up having to pay 20 grand when we closed the place so that the dude could could put it towards getting a new roof. Um, I mean, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. The the whole the, the the weather out there is stupid. The wind is ridiculous. The growing season is non-existent. Um, there's no water. It's a, it's a basically a high plains desert. So bottom line. Cheyenne is not a great place to live. Now, there may be other places in Wyoming that are better, especially closer up to the central part and the north, uh, the northwestern part that they, they get pretty good. It gets it gets good up there in the mountains. But yeah, I don't know. Ozark hiker 23. I used to visit the Ozarks all the time. I grew up in Grain Valley, Missouri. And uh, we used to go down and float the Current River and the North Fork of the White and the Jack's Fork and the Niangua and what else? I don't remember. But, yeah, we used to float those rivers all the time down in the Ozarks, and I love it down there. Um, that's not a bad place to, to, to retire or to settle down. Uh, I'd say that from a, from a purely prepping standpoint, the one issue that you'd have to deal with in the Ozarks, at least in most places, is that the soil is not real great. Um, it's pretty clay, kind of, kind of that red clay kind of area, or orange clay, whatever. So, <laughs> Killing 110 says Cheyenne is flat. Yeah, it's roll, rolling hills. It's not, it's not real mountainous or anything like that at all. Um, it's, it's kind of rolling hills, but man, it's windy as hell. Uh I'm just reading through the chats here. If you guys got any questions or anything you want to talk about, let me know. I'm going to try to, once we get everything going again, I'll start doing the weekly live streams again and all that kind of stuff. Hey, David, David Jones. I have a buddy. Where'd that, where'd that book go? <laughs> I have a buddy. He's not you, but David Jones wrote this book. He was my teammate on the anti-terrorism specialty team. That's not a picture of him, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, same name. And I always think of him whenever I see you on the on the picture. But that's his that's his book. If you guys want to check that out, it's uh, Guardians of Rockport: The Collapse. So um, kind of cool deal. I've got two two friends that are that are both authors. Uh, John Hollerman was my classmate in uh, in Sears School, uh, class ninety seven oh two, and then David Jones was my my uh, teammate at the AST. I probably should write a book one of these days and be one of the cool kids. What else you guys got going on here? Hmm. Into the Wilderness says, seriously, the best skills to tighten up on in the coming months. I think the thing that most people are going to have the biggest problem with is probably going to be power generation. Um, and I know that sounds crazy in the United States to think that we're going to have issues with reliable power, but I think that that could be a reality, honestly. Um, I'll answer that question here in a minute, Lamb is a Light. Um, power generation is going to be a problem. We had a problem here just the other day because uh, some trees tree branches fell into the line and caught on fire and all that kind of stuff. And it was the weirdest outage because it was half voltage. Basically it was like we were getting half the voltage. And so the, the lights were just kind of dim and everything the motors were trying to run, but they couldn't run, but it never did go all the way out. So, you know, we ended up just flipping the breaker off until they got it fixed. But, um, cause I didn't want to damage any of the motors or, you know, 
the electronics or anything, but uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think the electric companies are going to have a hard time keeping linemen. Um, they're going to be uh, laying people off. They're um, the green energy, the green energy bill and all that that they just passed and everything. They're going to be spending more money. Um, the cars are going to be, the grids are going to be overloaded with electric cars because electric cars are coming. You, you can bet your butt on it. All those companies are getting all those subsidies. They're going to start making electric cars. They just found a huge lithium mine here in the United States that will handle up to 50 million batteries, they think, 50 million electric vehicles in Utah. So uh, electric cars are coming whether you want them to or not. It's just going to happen. And what's, what, what's coming with that is the grid is going to end up getting overloaded because the, 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 the natural load that that takes at the same time, they're reducing the coal and the natural gas input and they're putting in um, solar panels and wind generation. And that's going to make it even worse because those are more unreliable. So I think power generation is going to be a problem. Um, and I think it makes sense to try to get, I'm going to be getting a whole house generator just like I did at the last place. I was contemplating getting a uh, Generac power cell and then what I was going to do is I was going to do it in phases. I was going to do the power cell and then a transfer switch because most power outages, if you could fill up that power cell with all six batteries, maybe you could run it a day or two, your house a day or two, if you were, if you were uh, rationing. Um, and then you could charge it up with a generator. And, and then, you know, once it's charged up, then let it run for another day or two and that kind of thing. It kind of worked back and forth. That way you don't work your generator so much. Problem is they're expensive. They're like 17 grand. Um, and I can, you know, I could do two generators for that much to two whole house generators. So I'm not going to end up going that route right now, but, uh, we don't have any propane in this house. So I'm gonna have to get a propane tank and, um, and then, and then put them, put in the generator just like we did last time. But to answer your question, skills, as far as knowing how to have or set up some sort of independent power grid at your place, whether it be solar or wind or through, you know, just backup generation or something like that. Cause I think we're going to see a lot of intermittent brownouts, rolling blackouts, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's going to be a problem, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, I did also, um, just sign up with, um, EcoFlow Delta and Blue Yeti, uh, both of them. Um, they've got some, I think they've probably got the best, um, solar generators on the market right now. Both of them have got really, really good, good units. Um, and so you can take a look at those and I think I've got a discount code for one or the other of them, like 5%. But I think that's the big thing that's coming is, uh, that's going to be the biggest change. Now in the food arena, I think you're going to have less and less of the specialty items and the, the foo-foo, like Asian fusions, you know, silliness and stuff, and just more of the basics, you know. I don't think we're going to have any long-term food shortages, but I think there definitely will be regional spotty outages, you know. Um, now let me go back to the question um, that somebody asked. Is it too late? Um, somebody said, is it too late to start prepping? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I think that it's, it's a perfect time to start prepping. And um, honestly, <clears throat> even though we are experiencing uh, a lot of inflation in particular areas, we are also at the same time going through what they call a reverse bullwhip, where you'll see really high inflation and then you'll see really low deflation and really cheap prices and then really high prices and then really low prices. So if you if you keep some money in cash and accessible and you really watch the, the deals, I think you're going to find like some really good deals coming up because what happens is what what is happening is, is we've got this this rush of this backfill of products that have been coming in, you know, all those containers that were sitting out on the, on the, um, 
on the ships and all that kind of stuff for a long time. That's all getting flooded in. And, and the stores are having inventory issues where they're, they're overstocked with inventory. And so uh, the problem is, is that nobody's buying because the inflation's so high. Well, when the inflation gets so high, they have all these products, then they're going to have to discount them really low to get rid of them and to, to sell them. So if you've got money, then you can you can make you can get some good purchases, some good deals. I mean, I've already started seeing stuff that's 25, 30 percent you know, lower than normal. Um, but I think it'll be bigger discounts than that. I saw especially in the electronics area. Um, but I saw a 75 inch TV today at Walmart for six hundred and fifty dollars. That's a ridiculous deal. But um, so. Yeah, I don't think it's too late to start prepping. I think uh, you've got plenty of time. Um, there is not, I do not believe, I've never have believed um, with a high degree of, of probability that there's going to be like one event. It's not going to be just, oh, the SHTF, the shit hit the fan. We got to like, the balloon went up. It's time to go. You know, the, the zombies are here, that kind of thing. That's that's not what's going to happen. Uh, and I, I have I planned a video on talking about this, too. But um, if you guys haven't read George Friedman and Peter Zeehan um, and Ray Dalio and some of those other guys, like the, uh, these geopolitical guys um, that look at, like, long-term macro trends and everything like that, they they have a pretty good, good – picture of what's coming and it's not going to be good for China. It's not going to be good for Russia. Um, as a matter of fact, there, both of those countries are in serious, serious difficulties right now, especially China. Um, and the United States, we are experiencing a big economic problem and it's probably going to get worse. It's probably going to get bad enough that they're going to have to reset the currency into a digital currency. I do believe that will happen within the next 12 to 18 months, but that's not going to be that big of a deal. I know it, it, it's going to be a big deal from a loss of freedom standpoint, a hundred percent. It's going to be the worst loss of freedom ever. And it'll be the most, the, the most massive tax increases that we've ever seen as well. But the country is going to keep going. Country is going to keep rolling. The country is going to keep going. It's not going to totally collapse or anything like that. They're not going to, you know, um, it, it, everything is going to continue. So it, it'll be okay, <laughs> but it's going to, it's going to get ugly, right? It's going to, it's going to be pretty bad. There's going to be a lot of layoffs. There's going to be a lot of economic downturn. There's going to be a lot of personal SHTF situations where people were in debt the interest rates spiked and they can't make their payments anymore and they have to go through bankruptcy and all that kind of stuff like that kind of stuff. Those personal situations are going to be very real and going to be very common, but the country is sound. All the big macro things that make a country, a country America has in spades. We've been blessed by God to a level that you cannot possibly imagine. And even the incompetence of Joe Biden as crazy as that sounds, is not going to collapse this country. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep making it. We're going to. It's it's going to continue going. The the uh, World Economic Forum. I wasn't really planning on talking about this today, but I'll talk about it a little bit. What the World Economic Forum is is they are a group of people who whose countries and companies benefited greatly from the Bretton Woods Agreement. Okay, the Bretton Woods Agreement happened after World War II. The United States came together at Bretton Woods here in New Hampshire. They had a big, you know, meeting with with a lot of uh, international partners. And, you know, what everybody expected the United States to do was to say, okay, we're going to take control of all these areas. We're going to be imperialists, you know, because that up to that point, that's what had happened. That's the, the world was, you know, still fresh out of imperialism and from World War One, And we didn't do that. We decided we're going to allow free trade. This was the New World Order, okay? Bretton Woods in 1945 was when the New World Order happened. And it took place. 
and it's ending now. Okay, this is not even remotely up for debate. It is happening. Um, and the World Economic Forum is a group of elites who are pitching their loudest fit to try to hold on to globalism. They want to try to keep the New World Order in place, the Bretton Woods Agreement in place, so that their countries and their companies don't collapse. And so they're trying to collude together. They're trying to get together with all these big fund managers and all this kind of stuff. And they're trying to you know, use ESG and everything like that to, in order to keep the globalism alive if they can, because they know it's dying. And that's why it's such a big thing right now. Um, but globalism is coming apart at the seams. There is, um, and it's not so much that there's going to be a multipolar order. The, the United States will still be supreme across all measurable outputs, all measurable scales, um, everything like that. However, we're going to have to rebuild our industrial base, right? Which we're already doing at a very fast pace. Um, and it's it's going to be a rough economic time while we start to resource and figure out you know where we can get our resources from and all that kind of stuff because the the trade the long distance trade and all that kind of stuff um where you where you see supply chains have 30 or 40 different you know components coming from across the seas into one place where it's manufactured and then shipped out that's going that's going away it's going to be a lot different than that it's going to be more Western Hemisphere focused. There'll be some focus in the uh, pivot in the Pacific to, you know, Indonesia and Malaysia and uh, Vietnam, Thailand, different, you know, areas there. But for the most part, um, we're, we're pulling back, okay? We're pulling back globally. And what that means is, is that these countries are going to be left to fend for themselves and they're not going to be able to do it because they don't have the navies to do it. They don't have the militaries to do it and they just don't have the economic capacity. And unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of people die. And we've, we've already, um, if, if we haven't hit peak population now, we will shortly. Um, and it's going to start declining quickly. Um, it's not, and, it, and it's it's very very unfortunate um, because uh, sub-Saharan Africa and um, the third the third world basically is going to be they're going to hurt through this um, a lot, and it's it's not it's not good for them. You can look at look at um, uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka four years ago bought into all of the ESG stuff, and they started doing everything that that everybody at the World Economic Forum. And all those guys told them to do. And now their country is in fucking ruins. Um, and that is uh, by design, if you ask me. That's these, the World Economic Forum is a particularly uh, insidious group of people. And what they're doing is, is they're trying to exploit these smaller and developing countries as fast as they can, as hard as they can, to enrich themselves so that those countries don't have the chance to um, develop. Um, the, the developing world in Africa is the fastest growing place in the world. And it's also one of the places where they're trying to push that down, um, and, and basically stop their growth, um, and keep them from using, um, natural gas and coal and all that kind of stuff for electric production, because they don't want them to be able to develop. Like the only way that a society can develop into an industrialized nation is to use fossil fuels. That's the only plan for success that we have at this point. And um, they're trying to keep them from using that. And I think that's just really crappy and, and extraordinarily racist. But, you know, that's just just me, I guess. So anyway, uh, to answer your question, in the United States, we are going to be fine. It's going to be a bumpy road. There is going to be some economic problems. Now, all of this is contingent upon the fact that there is not some black swan event. If there is a black swan event like an EMP or somebody lobs a nuke or something like that, obviously that changes the calculus a little bit. 
but I don't think that that's probably going to happen. I think that's still, a, you know, it's, it's less than it's, it's right around the 10% in my book. Um, I think it's more like a 90% chance that that's not going to take place in, in my view. Um, so it's still really important though, to make sure that you've got your preps because there are going to be regional outages in food and, and stuff, just shortages here and there. There are, are probably going to be more and more electric outages and power outages. So that's important. There's definitely going to be a lot of unemployment and a lot of civil unrest. So you need to have your security taken away or take squared away. And you know what? As people start to unravel, their mental health starts to decline and people's driving habits get more erratic. There's road rage and all that kind of stuff. So you need to have your medical squared away and stuff as well. Um, one of the things I was going to show you guys is... I'm not going to break it down fully right now, but one of the videos that I've got for you, uh, this is the um, ARC kit from Refuge Medical, the advanced rip-away kit. And it's built, I'll just show you here. It's got a little tab, and it's built so that it can rip away from this molly pouch, and it's got everything you need in your blowout kit. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Bear over at Bear Independent, he's the one that runs the Bear Independent channel. He's the one that runs Refuge Medical, and uh, I signed up to be an affiliate with his company. So if you use the discount code Reality Survival, you can save 10% off. Um, so it's a pretty good deal. They they make the best they make the best first aid kits out there. I mean, they just they just do uh, trauma kits, first aid kits, all that kind of stuff. Okay, Sandy Hopkins says she's subbed to my channel, but for some reason she never sees me. Well, that's probably for the last two months because I've been moving. I moved from Indiana to New Hampshire, and I've been kind of silent for the most part. Um, if you click the bell icon, that will hopefully notify you when we put videos up. But uh, YouTube definitely does not promote my channel at a at a high rate <laughs> for having as many subscribers as we do we, we don't hardly get any views um you know and that's just because they they push us down in the algorithm and all that and whatever i don't care i don't really do it for the for the views and for the for the subscriptions and all that kind of stuff all right yeah ozark hiker 23 says i've taken responder one with refuge medical and highly recommend it Lamb is the light. I had a question about our gravity spring. Go ahead, Lamb is the light. What is your question? That's a great point as well. Grumpy Acre Farm. Um, Grumpy Acres. He says, amen on the mental aspect. You're not nearly as mentally prepared as you think you are. Yeah, you really need to think about um, and practice working in high stress situations if you can. Um, and what I mean by that is take, take your, your first aid kit. If you see somebody on the side of the road, getting in an accident, grab your kit, go see if you can help. Right. What that does, aside from just being a good citizen, it also helps you prioritize your actions in emergency situations so that you can deal with them more effectively. That's why like special forces people and, um, you know, green berets and all that kind of stuff, when they do training, they do high stress training so that when they're in real situations in real combat, they have, they have practiced in high stress areas. And so for you, you can do the same thing by trying to insert yourself into high stress situations or go out, take your backpack, Go camping for a couple of days. Put yourself in a stressful situation and environment. See what you use. See you know, use your stuff. You know that kind of thing. Um, take classes like the, the responder one or responder two or three, where it gets even more intense, and they 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 purposefully build stressful training for you so that you really know how to use this equipment. Um, you know that that the aspect of training to a high level cannot be stated enough. You know, it really, you really need to use your skills. You really need to use your equipment. You really need to put yourself in these situations and then think about what would I do if, 
and just say, okay, a tornado, I'm going to do X number of things and then write those things down in an order and put it in your emergency binder. I've got a bunch of these checklists on my website, AmericanPreppingAcademy.com. You can go download them all for free. It's all the stuff that was Patreon content before, but I made it free to everybody. There's a bunch of different checklists in there. You can print those out. You can put them in your emergency binders and you can modify them to how you would do things, you know. Um, But that at least gives you like, oh, crap, there's a forest fire coming. What should I do or what should I do beforehand even to prep for those things? You know, like there's there's a ton of that stuff over there on the website. So check that out. Um, But anyway, yeah, they do have these things in stock right now. They're they're pretty much fully stocked up. um, And I would highly recommend that you go check it out if you don't have that kind of stuff. This is the perfect setup. This little panel right here is a perfect way to like hook it to the back of your uh, your seat back, you know, so it's right there where you need it and all that kind of stuff. You can just rip it off. It works out really good. David Jones says, have I made any apple pies? I have not yet. Um, I went back and looked at the tree the other day and the one that I grabbed in that video was perfect. I was going to go back and eat it and it's gone. <laughs> I think the deer are probably coming and visiting the tree, uh, you know, late at night and and eating all my apples that at least like that I can reach anyway. (laughs) But yeah, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm gonna have to keep an eye on them. Let's see here. Uh, Our our chickens did start laying eggs. I'm guessing it was probably the hot weather because we've now got like four dozen eggs already, four or five dozen. I mean, they're just, they're really busy laying eggs. Uh, Lamb is the light. Should we test it once in a while? We don't use it anymore but I keep it a secret in case we need it. Oh, you're talking about, um, I assume you're talking about a, a spring. Are you talking about just a, just a basic, a regular spring? Cause if it's spring water coming from the ground as a general rule, you shouldn't have to test it. I don't know if I'm really fully understanding your question though. Um, Yeah, I don't know for sure, but sorry, I'm, I'm not able to answer that more clearly. If you can clarify, then maybe I can, uh, maybe I can try to answer better. I don't know. Holy cow, we're already almost up to an hour here. See you later, Lady T. Uh, that's a good, that's interesting. Grumpy Acres Farm says, I've been at this for 20 plus years. I thought I was wired tight. We had our own personal SHTF situation and basically bugged out. Did not handle it nearly as well as I thought I would. Yeah, when I um, when I was let go from uh, the task force that I worked on, when they excused me from that, I thought for sure that the Air Force was going to tell me, hey, sorry, you're, you're going to let you go. And uh, so, although they didn't, I didn't know that they weren't going to for a couple of months and um, because it it was just surprising to me that they took the side of of freedom, which I guess it shouldn't be surprising to me. But um, but uh, during that time frame, I was pretty concerned because I'm like, man, I'm, you know, pretty much the single breadwinner in the family. And um, we had some savings and some investments and stuff like that, but not much. Um, and it definitely wouldn't have been enough to sustain, you know, making the payment on that place and all that kind of stuff. And so it really started making me think more about trying to make sure I have a bigger emergency fund, you know, more cash set back, uh, to deal with, you know, situations like that, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. So lamb is the light. I don't, I don't think if it comes off of a mountain, I don't, I don't know what kind of testing you would need to do. Um, obviously it, you're going to have to purify the water before you drink it. Cause any ground water, you want to make sure you purify before you drink it. Even if it's coming up from a spring, because you don't necessarily know where it came through and all that kind of stuff. And it's just a good rule of thumb to make sure that you purify all that. Um, but you know, I would, I would maintain that, uh, spring, you know, and try to keep it clear and keep it running. And if it gets, you know, too full of silt and stuff, you know, dig it out, um, and keep it available because you just never know.
That's good, Sandy. That's that's good that you had that ability to focus like that when you had an emergency. That's important. Okay, guys. Well, I think I'm going to get off here. Uh, before I go, I will remind you that if you have not purchased an EMP shield yet, you might want to think about it. Like I said earlier, I don't think it's a real high probability, but if somebody did decide to lob any nuke over or do an EMP, um, having an EMP shield on your house and your car, especially, is a real. It gives you a really big advantage, and the reason that gives you a big advantage is because you can plug your generator in to your transfer switch, and you'd still be able to run all the stuff in your house. That's a huge force multiplier. Having the real ability to refrigerate, that run your well, run your hot water heaters, all that kind of stuff. That's a big, big deal. Um, if there was a catastrophe like that, so. Um, make sure you guys check those out. You can just go to empshield.com and then use the discount code reality survival. And last but not least, check out bear over at refuge medical as well. Um, again, discount code reality survival. Thanks for watching guys, North Carolina farmer. What's going on, bud? I missed hearing from you as well. Oh, nice. Grumpy Acres is an investor in EMP Shield. You bet, yeah. I think their stuff's good. I mean, it's sound. Uh, Keystone Compliance Labs does all the testing for them, and uh, I've looked at the test results, and I'm satisfied that you know that they actually do what they say they're going to do, and that seems like a pretty good deal to me. So, anyway, guys, I will talk to you later. Uh, it's getting late here. It's already like eleven o'clock, so I gotta get to bed. See you guys. Bye.